This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Reed Pence. This week, how COVID may destroy the sense of smell. We had a patient who had divided her house down the middle because she couldn't stand the smell of her partner and it was destroying their relationship at the time. Altered smells long after you thought you were recovered when Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Nancy Benson, host of Radio Health Journal. If you enjoy listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. The plastics industry has spent a lot of time and money and lobbying efforts on making us feel like if we see that chasing arrow symbol, that the packaging is recyclable, And as long as we put it in the bin, everything's going to be just fine. The deepening global plastic crisis. Then... The eastern population of monarchs has suffered about a 90% decline in the population over the last 20 years. The beauty and great migration of the monarch butterfly. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Viewpoints on your favorite radio station and subscribe and listen to shows anytime on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. At least 30 million Americans have had COVID-19. Studies say more than half of them have had one symptom in common, the loss of their sense of taste and smell. For many, it's the first symptom they notice, the giveaway that they're infected, sometimes two or three days before a positive COVID test. And as it goes on, it can be extremely disturbing. The sense of smell orients us in the world. It's how we know where we are. I think we're all stuck behind screens at the moment with COVID-19. When you lose your sense of smell, you also lose an orientation to the world around you. You can feel really detached and disassociated. Dr. Deka Burgess Watson is a researcher and lecturer in medical sciences at Newcastle University in the UK. We also know, for example, that intimacy is directly related to our sense of smell. We bond with our children because we can smell their hair. We bond with our partners because we smell them. We are excited by the smell of our partners. You know, there's a a very interesting relationship between smell and intimacy. So to lose your sense of smell and to lose it so suddenly, which is quite unique with COVID, in fact, you suddenly appreciate what it means to be able to have this sense of smell. Suddenly, you know, people are are coming to us and saying things like, I suddenly realised that I miss the smell of fresh cut grass and clean laundry and the scent of my significant other. I feel like I don't exist anymore. Chrissy Kelly knows all about it. She lost her sense of smell when she got COVID last April, actually the second time it happened to her. Kelly founded the nonprofit organization Absent.org after the first time in 2012, following another viral infection. It was a very bizarre moment for me to realize that suddenly I couldn't smell anything. It just happened overnight, woke up in the morning, found that I had no smell, went around the bathroom, tried every all the products that were in the bathroom, and with each passing sniff of shampoo or soap or whatever it was, I began to get more and more distressed. I didn't get a very sympathetic response from my GP other than to say, it's too bad, it might come back and it might not. So that was a very destabilizing for me, very, very difficult period in my life. One of the most harrowing changes resulting from a loss of smell is a person's relationship with food. Burgess Watson says the sense of taste is actually mostly smell, and without it, everything tastes bland. All you're getting is sweet, sour, bitter, salty and umami. It's like holding your nose all the time. It's like having a really bad cold constantly. Everything just tastes bland. And so there are a couple of things that can happen with that. You feel like you're not getting the satisfaction of a good meal, so you chase it. So you're constantly filling your face going, I'm just not feeling satisfied. So you eat more sugary, fatty, salty foods because that is at least giving you some feedback. And so we've had reports of some people saying they're putting on a lot of weight as a result of anosmia or the loss of sense of smell. Other people are finding that they just completely lose interest in food because there is no flavour, because it's not giving them any joy, and they'll just stop eating altogether. 
losing the sense of smell can lead to feelings of depression and a loss of well-being. This is not just something that you feel because you're bereaved about your lost sense of smell, but we know that this is the way the brain works. When the olfactory bulb stops getting messages from the nose, things start to happen in the brain, and this can lead to depression. However, Kelly says a later phase of COVID recovery for many people may be even worse. It's called parosmia. Parosmia is the distortion of smells, and it means that everyday food items can take on this very disgusting property that makes people, in some cases, want to be sick. There is a generalized pattern of the person suddenly one day realizing that everything starts to smell disgusting. And in this first phase, these disgusting smells all have one similar character. And then over time, this one smell, which people are calling the COVID smell, can sort of be split out into a number of different smells. But in almost all cases, Parosmia is a very unpleasant experience. It can be deeply confusing. So suddenly the world that you knew and understood smells revolting. You don't want to be in it. You don't want to be near your partner. You can't bear the smell of the toast. You can't go supermarket shopping because the supermarket, walking into a supermarket makes you feel like you want to vomit. It's really distressing. I can still remember when we first started this research, I didn't know the term parosmia either, but we had a patient who had divided her house down the middle because she couldn't stand the smell of her partner's cooking and she couldn't stand the smell of her partner and it was destroying their relationship at the time. Doctors say that before COVID, it was rare to see someone with distorted smell. Now, some doctors see several every week and it can come at a bad time for someone recovering from COVID, just when they think they're home free and their other symptoms have gone away. That's how it was for Kelly. She got COVID last April. The parosmia didn't set in until September. It can come sometimes later when you don't expect it. So we'll have people in our group who have lost their sense of smell. They've started to recover. Everything seems okay. Things don't seem distorted at all. They're feeling happy and optimistic about the fact that their sense of smell has returned. And then sometime later, sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's up to five months, suddenly the parosmia is there. So people will have lost their sense of smell, then it will start to come back, then they might develop parosmia, then it might disappear altogether, then it might come back again, the parosmia might be worse or better, and then they'll go into another fluctuation cycle. And this is, of course, very worrying for the patient because they've already lost their sense of smell once. Every time there's any kind of a downturn, that just raises their anxiety levels again. So it's quite distressing for people. Kelly and Burgess Watson say one reason it's so distressing is that people often get no sympathy from family members and friends who simply don't get it. They don't understand that it's not just a little bad odor. It's not something you can just live with. There's no visible sign that there's anything wrong with you. So when you say, oh my God, that just smells revolting and I can't bear it, it's pretty meaningless to anybody else. And it's very difficult because people are accused of being over-exaggerating or being dramatic or just generally, what are you complaining about? You look perfectly normal. But actually, this is an overpowering smell. Everybody says the same thing. Nobody understands me. That is the, the chorus that we hear in the Facebook groups. Smell loss and particularly parosmia are practically impossible to describe. It's nothing like anything that you've ever smelled before if you've got parosmia. Having no sense of smell is unlike anything that you've ever experienced before. It really does defy description. And that's what is so isolating. For people who are living in families, for instance, where other family members don't get it, don't understand how awful it is to even be in the same house where coffee is brewing, of course, that is a terrible thing for the person who's suffering. Doctors know that olfactory support cells in the nose are damaged by COVID infection, and they have some theories as to what's going on to create the mix-up in odor perception. Burgess Watson says those should give people who are afflicted some hope that it won't last forever. 
as we currently understand it, we think this is actually a sign of the cells regenerating and relearning. It's like you've suddenly got baby cells that are starting to grow and they don't know what's going on. The messages are getting mixed up in the brain. So we think that it's a good sign and that parosmia is a sign that you will recover at some point. We don't know when, but you will recover. So that's something to hold on to. However, simply holding on is a tough recommendation for people who are in desperate need of help. Kelly says doctors don't have a lot of answers. Medicine does not really have any good solutions to this problem. And that is contributing to this feeling of hopelessness amongst the patients. What can be offered to people are things like support groups where they can get into conversations with people who are in exactly the same situation. And we see that is very, very beneficial to find people that understand to have their feelings validated. This is a, an extremely important part of a kind of therapy for this. Kelly's organization, Absent.org, is one of the world's top resources for support. And we'll give you the web address again in just a few minutes. Absent has Zoom meetings, safe spaces, education, and tips and tricks that its more than 60,000 members have found useful for living with parosmia. Kelly and Burgess Watson are also working with the Altered Eating Research Network, and they say knowing triggers is helpful in managing parosmia. Coffee is a classic trigger for parosmia. So many people all over the world are saying, I just suddenly can't bear the smell of my coffee. It makes me want to vomit. It makes me feel sick. I just I can't be in a room with coffee. And coffee has a whole range of different chemicals within it that seem to trigger this parosmia. So we're starting now to understand what some of those key triggers are. We have coffee, onions, garlic, cucumber, watermelon, anything that involves a cooking process where you cook foods up. In fact, temperature itself can increase the volatile component of food such that you are kind of experiencing them more. So we kind of know the certain types of foods that one could avoid to avoid those triggers. However, Burgess Watson admits that avoiding cooking smells can be difficult. Tricks and practical advice can help people get through. If it's really bad, buying a nose clip, a swimming nose clip, and putting it on your nose when you're cooking or preparing food or even when you're eating, if it's that bad, then that is something that you can do. If it's so bad that you're finding eating most foods really difficult, then I and you're finding that you're losing weight, then I would hope if there was the availability of dietitians or nutritionists who can advise you on nutritional supplements that you can eat that have a low aromatic profile, so something that's very, very bland that you can eat so that at least you're getting enough nutrition to keep yourself alive, then I would do that. Burgess Watson says people with parosmia have to become sensory detectives to adapt their food and cooking to their temporary alteration. She says a cookbook called Taste and Flavor by Ryan Riley and Kimberly Duke is aimed at people with taste and smell issues like these. The cookbook is free online at lifekitchen.co.uk. And the resource we mentioned earlier is always free as well. It's absent.org, spelled A-B-S-C-E-N-T dot org. You can find links to those resources and to all of our guests on our website, radiohealthjournal.org. I'm Reed Pence. During pregnancy and up to three months after delivery, a woman is at increased risk for a dangerous blood clot. A blood clot traveling from the legs to the lungs is one of the most common causes of pregnancy-related death in the United States. If a blood clot forms during pregnancy, it can harm the developing baby as well as the mother. That's why Dr. Andra James, high-risk pregnancy expert at Duke University, suggests that pregnant women talk with their doctor about blood clots. Talk with your family about your health history and tell your doctor if you or anyone in your family has ever had a blood clot. Also, talk with your doctor about managing your risks 
and learn how to prevent a clot from forming. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention wants you to know the signs and symptoms of a blood clot. Arms or legs where a blood clot is formed may be warm to the touch, painful, swollen, or red or discolored. A blood clot in the lungs may produce difficulty breathing, chest pain that worsens with a deep breath, and coughing up blood. If you have any of these signs or symptoms, seek immediate medical care. Find out more from the National Blood Clot Alliance at StopTheClot.org. Cardiovascular, or CV, disease is the number one killer of adults in the U.S., and millions of people trying to reduce their risk of a heart attack or stroke may unknowingly be taking medications that are not proven, nor FDA-approved to reduce cardiovascular risk. Let's hear from cardiologist Dr. John Osborne. Many people are unaware that after a failed outcome study, the FDA withdrew the approval of phenofibrate when added to statins as the risk outweighed the benefit to heart health. It's important to remember that statins, along with diet and exercise, can lower cardiovascular risk by about 25 to 35 percent, but persistent cardiovascular risk, which can lead to a life-threatening event, may remain. I would tell anyone still being prescribed phenofibrate, such as Tricor and Terra and Trilibix, with a statin to talk to their doctor about FDA-approved therapies for cardiovascular risk reduction. To learn more and get clear on the facts, visit itsclearTomeNow.com. Again. That's it's clear to me now.com. Blood clots affect about 900,000 Americans each year, resulting in about 100,000 deaths, more than from AIDS, breast cancer, and motor vehicle crashes combined. Hospitalization, surgery, and physical trauma are major factors that put you at risk for blood clots, according to Dr. Gregory Maynard, Chief Quality Officer at the University of California Davis Medical Center. About half of all blood clots occur during a hospital stay or within 90 days of one. Most of these blood clots can be prevented, but fewer than half of hospital patients receive proper prevention measures. So before you're admitted to the hospital, talk with your doctor and develop a blood clot prevention plan. Anyone can develop a blood clot. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention advises that you know the signs. Signs of a blood clot in the legs or arms include pain and swelling with skin that's warm to the touch, red or discolored. Signs of blood clots in your lungs are difficulty breathing, chest pain that worsens with a deep breath, coughing up blood, and a faster than normal or irregular heartbeat. If you think you have a blood clot, seek immediate medical care. Find out more from the National Blood Clot Alliance at Stop the Clot org and that's radio health journal for this week radio health journal is a production of media tracks communications follow us on twitter facebook and instagram to learn more and check apple podcasts google play and spotify for a library of past programs plus you'll always find previous segments and information about our guests at radiohealthjournal.org join us again next week for another edition of radio health journal Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. In many ways, we may want to think of the pandemic as having hit the pause button on people's fertility. And the question is, will they take their finger off that button once the world returns to a little more of normal? The COVID baby bust. Then getting up to speed on colorectal cancer. We're seeing sort of an alarming increase in patients under the age of 50. And several years ago, the American Cancer Society actually lowered the age of screening to 45 from 50 where it had been previously. All that and more on Radio Health Journal.